This morning we're going to be looking at Matthew chapters 12 and 13. I want to spend most of our time in the parable of the sower, which is in Matthew 13. So let's start in Matthew 12, verse 1, and we'll move quickly through some of the things we're going to read in this chapter. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. I tell you something greater than the temple is here, and if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now I want you to remember briefly how we concluded the sermon last week. We finished up in Matthew chapter 11, and at the end there, Jesus says, "'Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light.'" The Pharisees had been burdening the people with all these laws and regulations going even beyond what the law of God had stipulated and saying, hey, if you want to be in God's good graces, if you want to be in his favor, if you want to have everlasting life, you have to do all of these things as well. So they were burdening the people with all of this legalism. Hence why Jesus says, come to me, all you who have been laboring for righteousness, you will not find it in your works. The righteousness that we need to enter into the presence of God is found only in Jesus Christ. Through Christ, through his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, now ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God, through Jesus and through him alone, do we have fellowship with God. You are saved by grace through faith and not of works. This is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one may boast, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. And so it is through Christ that we have the righteousness of God. It is through Christ that we have fellowship with God. This is what Jesus said to his disciples at the end of Matthew 11. And then what we see in Matthew 12, we see exactly an example of those rules and regulations the Pharisees would impose upon people burdening them with all of these laws that you couldn't keep anyway, nor would it even lead to your righteousness. And this was in regards to how they taught about the Sabbath. So Jesus is walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. This is the day of rest, seventh day of the week, Saturday. We consider Sunday to be our Sabbath day. It's the Lord's day, for he was in the tomb on Sabbath. He rose again from the dead on Sabbath. Sunday. And so this becomes the day that we gather together as the church. We rest from our work and we rejoice in the presence of God and with his people. So the uh, so on the Saturday, it would have been the Saturday, it would have been that would have been the Sabbath here at this particular time. Jesus and the disciples walking through the grain field, the disciples began to pluck the heads of grain. When the Pharisees saw it, they said, Your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath because plucking the heads of grain was considered to be work. And Jesus said, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? Now, first of all, this is a very indicting question that Jesus begins with. Have you not read? Yeah, they're Pharisees. They're supposed to be well read. So they're imposing things that aren't in the law. And Jesus says, have you not read that David what, uh, what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only the priests. The point that Jesus is making here is this. You don't condemn David for eating the showbread, which only the priests were supposed to eat. 
So why are you condemning me? One who is greater than David, by the way. David was the anointed one of God. That's why the Pharisees wouldn't have condemned David in that story, because he, uh, he was anointed by God and he was doing God's work. So is Jesus. Hence why he concludes this by saying, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And then he goes on to illustrate that even one greater than the temple is here. He says in verse 5, Or have you not read in the law how those on the Sabbath... Uh, how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless. Jesus is being sarcastic here. He's not saying that the priests actually do profane the Sabbath, but even the priests work on the Sabbath. But their work on the Sabbath is not profaning the Sabbath because it says in the law what it is that they're supposed to do on the Sabbath. You don't say that they're profaning the Sabbath, yet one greater than the temple is here. That's Christ. So therefore, whatever he has done, Whatever his disciples are doing in his fellowship cannot possibly be lawful on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. That's from Hosea 6.6, 6, and it's the second time that Jesus has actually quoted that passage here in Matthew. He did so earlier in Matthew chapter 9. But the, the point that he's making here is that God gave the Sabbath to man. Not man for the Sabbath. We find that another place in Scripture. It is by the mercy of God that we have been given a day of rest. So to be told, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. It is a merciful thing that God has given the Sabbath. So why are you burdening people with all these Sabbath laws? But Jesus, who is Lord of the Sabbath, who is even greater than the Sabbath itself, is the one to whom even the Sabbath day was pointing. For Jesus is our Sabbath rest, and he fulfills all the laws regarding the Sabbath. Christ is our rest. We're going to go on from there and move through the rest of chapter 12 a little more quickly. He went on from there and entered their synagogue, and a man who was there with a withered hand they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? We're still continuing here with, with questions about the Sabbath. So that they might accuse him. They wanted to see if he was really going to do something to this man on a day when he was not supposed to be working. He said to them, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? It's a good question. So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and conspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen... My beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench, until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles will hope. And that is us even today. We hope in the name of Christ, who is our Sabbath rest. We can rest from our work, all of our labor, all of our attempts to gain righteousness, which we could not do because we were unrighteous. Romans 3.12, there is none righteous, no, not one. So not by our works could we ever have attained righteousness in the presence of God. It is only by faith in Christ who is the righteous one, who is the fulfillment of all the law and even here the prophets, the one to whom the law and the prophets was pointing. And he who has fulfilled these things has shown himself to be the one and only righteous Savior, the Messiah. He is that spotless lamb who died for us, that all who believe in him will not perish, but you will be cleansed from all unrighteousness and you will wear his righteousness. So I tell you, walk not in sin any longer. Walk in the righteousness 
of Jesus Christ. We go on into verse 22. Then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him, so that the man spoke and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, It is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man casts out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? In other words, if I really am Satan casting out Satan, then it's, it's not going to amount to anything. It's not going to go anywhere. Satan can't do that. He cannot accomplish his purposes by casting himself out. So if I am Satan casting out Satan, how, how does that even possibly make sense? <laughs> it's really kind of the logic argument that Jesus is making against them. And he uses uh, another uh, a strong argument with them here as we go on. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Burn. <laughs> if I'm casting out demons by Beelzebul and you have sons that are casting out demons, who are they casting out their demons by? Beelzebul? Is that the only way to cast out demons? So if you're saying that I'm casting them out by Satan, then you're calling your own sons satanic. But they will be your judges, Jesus goes on to say. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the man's house, I'm sorry, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. If it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house." Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will, will be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit, which will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. There's a lot of misunderstanding regarding this particular passage, but it, it often strikes fear in the hearts of people, and I'm glad that it does, that they are, are ever so cautious to ask and to be curious and wonder, have I committed that unpardonable sin? Have I blasphemed the Holy Spirit of God, and now it's not possible for me to gain forgiveness? There was a thing that was going on on YouTube about a dozen years ago, a little bit longer than that. It was called the... I want to say it was called the, uh, the Blasphemy Challenge. It was something that a lot of atheists were practicing on YouTube. And here was what the challenge was. They were challenging you to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because if you did that, there was no chance of you being saved. So it was almost like, make an absolute statement of your atheism. That you know there's absolutely no way for you to be converted out of this atheism that you proclaim. All you have to do is blaspheme the Holy Spirit, and you will signify once and for all you are truly an atheist until your death. And I watched several of these videos, and they were very sad. It was a number of people coming on those videos and saying, I blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You know, I will never believe in God. I blaspheme everything, you know, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes for me to solidify that, that I am an atheist, here it is. Now, the... Wonderful thing about that, yeah, I actually am able to find something good even out of all of that. The wonderful thing about that is God is so gracious that these people's evil and their blasphemy is not able to supersede his grace. What they were doing was not blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because they really had no idea what they were doing. They didn't even know who the Holy Spirit was. They were lost. They were unbelievers. None of you knows who the Holy Spirit is before you come to Christ. So how would you know if you've blasphemed him or not? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is when you have heard the word of Christ and you've refused to believe it all the way to your death. And then after that, there's no way for you to be saved. You must come to Christ now in this life. You must repent of your sin now and follow him. And if you continue to reject the Spirit's calling through the announcement of the gospel all the way to your death, 
You've committed blasphemy in the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a lot of debate among scholars as to whether or not the Pharisees were committing that blasphemy here. If they were not, they were certainly dangerously close. But I would say this of the Pharisees, there was no one that should have known who Jesus was more than they, because they had the word of God, and yet they refused to believe even by the miracles that they saw performed in front of their very eyes. So corrupt were their hearts that they were making such nonsense statements like, it's by Beelzebul that Jesus is casting out demons. It's by Satan that he's casting out Satan, which, as Jesus pointed out, that doesn't even make any sense. Satan divided against himself cannot stand. So how can I be Satan casting out Satan? That was the point that he was trying to make there. So the Pharisees who should have known who Jesus was, yet decided to attribute the things that he was doing, which were clearly miraculous in the power of God, they decided to attribute those things to Satan. Only God can cast out demons, not Satan. The Pharisees should have known better. So were they committing the unpardonable sin? I think this was certainly a demonstration that their hearts were very, very far from God. But just because you said... Uh, holy whatever, you know, (laughs) holy followed by some sort of swear word. Just because you've said that, you've said holy as a swear word, you shouldn't do that, but it doesn't mean that you've committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Anyone who's ever come to me and has said, I'm concerned, I'm worried that I may have uh, committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, I will say to them, the very fact that you're asking that question says to me that you haven't committed that sin. Because a person who has committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not going to feel guilty about it. They don't have the Spirit in their hearts to feel guilty about it. And so fret not, my friends. If you are alive and you are breathing and you are listening to the sound of my voice right now, you have not committed blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But I tell you, do not continue to play with fire. Turn from your sin and follow Christ. You will be filled with the Holy Spirit of God and you will be forgiven. We continue on in verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. This is in speaking about the Pharisees again, who we just had referred to as possibly committing the unpardonable sin. But you'll notice that this is something that Jesus had said earlier in Matthew chapter 7. He's now pointing to real life examples who were in their midst. Verse 34 You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of the good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. My social media users, I must tell you, that it's not just every word you've spoken that you will be judged for. It is also every careless word you have typed online. May we all regard these words in the fear of the Lord. Be careful about what you say. And we follow the instruction in Ephesians 4.29. Let your speech always be gracious, encouraging one another, building each other up with our words, that we may give grace to those who hear. I kind of mixed in a little bit of uh, Colossians 4 in there as well. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you are to answer each person. David asked that God would set a guard over the door of his mouth, so that what he would speak, let the words of my mouth be pleasing unto my God. And this is the way we are to regard ourselves. It's out of the heart the mouth speaks, So may what we say be a reflection of the God whom we serve with our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. If you worship God with all your strength, does that that not also include your tongue? Certainly it does. So Christ must be Lord of all of your life, even over the words that you speak. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. This, of course, is in reference to his death and his resurrection. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Reference to Christ. The queen of the south, the queen of Sheba, will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. On the podcast this past Thursday, I just tar- started teaching through Proverbs. Most of the Proverbs are attributed to Solomon, uh, uh, Solomon, but I said in the introduction to the Proverbs that Solomon's wisdom came from above. It did not come from himself. And so what we read even in Proverbs is the word of Christ, one who is even greater and wiser than Solomon. There was never a wiser king on earth until King Jesus came in the flesh who is even greater than Solomon. Verse 43, When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that person is worse than the first. So it will also be with this wicked generation. They were with Christ, and then when he is gone from them, the temptations that will come by way of Satan will be even greater than they were before Christ had come. The evil that they will be committing will be even greater, for they saw the Christ and did not believe him. And we see that even within our own generation. I talked to you last week about how prevalent the Bible is in our American culture, and and yet we can turn on the evening news and you can see the evil that our country is steeped in at the present. This wicked and adulterous generation will be judged if a person does not repent and follow Christ, they will perish. In that judgment. While he was still speaking to the people, behold, his mother and his brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. But he replied to the man who told him, Who is my mother and who is my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. We are of the brotherhood of Christ. We who are in Christ and do the will of our Father who is in heaven. Now, I did say that uh, I was going to spend most of our time this morning in Matthew chapter 13 in the parable of the sower, but I'm halfway through the sermon and I'm only going to spend just as much time in Matthew 13. So I'm pretty much (laughs) splitting this in half today. Let's look at the parable of the sower, Matthew 13, beginning in verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of his house, and he sat beside the sea, and great crowds gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up since they had no depths of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears... Let him hear. Now, before getting to the explanation of this parable, let's read the next part, because Jesus actually explains the parable in just a moment. So we'll come to understand it with Jesus' explanation too. Here we go in verse 10. Then the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? As as it said uh, again back in verse 3, he told them many things in parables. The disciples want to know why he speaks in parables. And Jesus says in verse 11, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. 
For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, You will indeed hear, but never understand. And you will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear, and their eyes they have been closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets... And righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. And then from here, Jesus is going to go on to explain the parable. So let's talk about what Jesus has just said here to his disciples. Now, oftentimes, whenever we refer to the parables, it's often said that the parables are stories. They're like metaphors, analogies that Jesus would give so that people can understand better the kingdom of God. Is that what a parable is? Yes and no. Because recognize here that Jesus says to his disciples, it's for you to understand the secrets of the kingdom. But it's not for them to understand the secrets of the kingdom. This is why I speak to them in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not hear. So the parables are being spoken for the disciples to understand. Anyone who is a follower of Christ, that's me and that's you. But there are others who will not understand this because it's not given for them to understand. So the parables actually conceal the truth of the kingdom of God from those who do not truly want God. They may want the gifts, but they do not want the giver. And so from them, even an understanding of the gifts is hidden from them so that they may not see it and they may not hear it. So parables are given that the disciples of Jesus would understand, but that those who are not disciples would not understand. These are not word pictures that Jesus is giving so that everyone would have a better understanding of the kingdom of God. And again, that's the way we often talk about parables, but that wasn't the use of the parables. There are some who won't get it precisely because Jesus speaks in parables. Remember back to Matthew chapter 11, which we read last week. In Matthew eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus prayed in the presence of his disciples, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that Christians cannot be wise and understanding? No, that's not what that means at all. In fact, like I said, I started a series in the book of Proverbs this past Thursday, right at the beginning of Proverbs, It says in Proverbs 1, 7 that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. And we are instructed quite clearly from the very beginning of Proverbs to get wisdom and insight. And that's even the purpose of the Proverbs. So we should be wise and understanding. But here the reference is to those who think that they are wise and understanding or those who may be wise and understanding by the world's standards. But just because you are wise... Just because you have much knowledge does not mean you know the things of the kingdom of God, the will of the Father himself, is hidden from those who think they know it, and it is revealed to those who are his children. You've revealed them to little children. As Jesus said to his disciples, unless you become like a child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That means that we are fully dependent on our heavenly Father for, any, for, for everything. Just like a child cannot survive without the love and care of their parents, so we cannot receive anything 
if not given to us by our Father. We are sustained, we are cared for, we are nurtured, we are grown by the care of our Father who is in heaven. And if we humble ourselves and come to Him as children, He reveals to us His good, pleasing, and perfect will, as it's described in Romans 12 too. We know the will of God when we are the children of God and we are adopted into this family and call upon Him as Father when we believe by faith in Jesus Christ. Once again, as Jesus has said here, those who do the will of my Father in heaven, they are my mother and my brother and my sisters. We are part of the family of God when we know Him through Christ, our fellowship with God. And so it is only to they who are followers of Jesus who have the, the will of God revealed. But to them it has not been given, Jesus says. Again, this is Matthew 13, verse 11, going on into verse 12. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. You who have the Savior, you will receive more, and you will have an abundance when you grow in wisdom and the knowledge of God according to his word. You grow in the knowledge of God when you study scripture, when you hear his word preached in church, when you hear it taught in Bible study, when you listen to great teachers You don't understand the will of God just walking around in nature and going, oh, God, look at these wonderful things that you've made for me. And naturalists do that, and they don't come to any deeper knowledge of God. In fact, as it says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the naturally minded man cannot understand spiritual things, for they are spiritually discerned. It is only those who have the Spirit of God dwelling within them who understand the things of God, who have God's will revealed. To us, which is why you can have a person who can read the whole Bible and then come away from it going, what a bunch of mumbo jumbo. I don't believe anything of that. It's because they were trying to understand it from their natural mind. But there are others that read this word and they see everlasting life. And it's because they had the spirit of God to read the mind of God and understand it. It was given to them by the father to understand the word of God. Jesus said in John 17, 17, again, another prayer that he prays with his disciples. He says, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. We are grown in holiness. We are grown in the knowledge of God and his will when we read his word. Just as we're doing this morning, and just as we do every Sunday that I have, I have preached this word to you, wonderful words of life as we sing about in the old hymn. This is why I speak to them in parables, Jesus said, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. That we have that prophecy, and Jesus saying to his disciples, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. And of course, what we're, say, what we're talking about hearing is, is hearing and believing and receiving, not just physically hearing, because everybody who's there on the shore is hearing this, but there are many who are not going to believe it. It's because they they don't receive it. They don't know. They don't understand. They turn from it, and they walk away from it, which is exactly what's being illustrated in the parable of the sower. And we're going to get to that explanation next. Verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, The evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So the seed represents the message of the kingdom. And let's say you have two people who are standing or listening to an evangelist share the message of the gospel. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we're justified by his grace as a gift. Jesus sent to this earth to die for our sins. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again from the grave according to the scriptures, fulfilling the prophecies. He was lifted up from the presence of the disciples before their very eyes. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of God. He's coming again to judge the living and the dead. Save yourselves from this wicked and crooked generation. Repent of your sin. Believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's say that's the message of the evangelist that these two people have listened to. You've got one there 
who listens to that and they're convicted in heart. And they're going, my, I am a sinner and the judgment of God is coming. I've rebelled against God and he is going to pour out his wrath on me. And he realizes through the hearing of the gospel that there's a savior who's been given who will forgive you all your sins against God. And they repent and they're mournful over their sin. They're convicted to heart and they weep and they receive with joy the good news of the gospel because that's what gospel means. It's good news. It's good news to the person who knows that they have sinned and what they deserve is judgment. But the other person next to them doesn't hear that in the message that's been proclaimed. He hears a fairy tale. He's like, ah, oh, these Christians and their sky fairy. This is no different than, than uh, believing in the tooth fairy or believing in Santa Claus. And he walks away. So the message of the kingdom was proclaimed. The seed was scattered. It fell on one heart who received it. It fell on another. He heard it, but immediately the enemy snatched it away from him. So he heard it with his ears, but it didn't have any effect. We refer to this as an effectual calling. The effectual calling wasn't there. The effectual calling was in the person next to him, but not on him. So Satan snatched the message of the kingdom from him, and he didn't believe it. Verse 20, as for the one, as, oh, sorry, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. So he's heard the word, and he even for a time demonstrates that he looks like a Christian. He knows all the good Christian jargon. He can probably share his testimony. So he sounds just like a believer. He's probably even enthusiastic about stuff. Hey, I'm in a church. I want to do some stuff, okay? Uh, give me something to do. So uh, we, we test him a little while. Maybe we give him an Awana class or something like that, or we, we get, you know, give him some other project here at the church that they can work on. Maybe not a class, maybe helping in the kitchen. We'll start there. <laughs> We're not going to give you little kids to teach yet. We'll, we'll start you on something simple. Maybe you can even go out with the evangelism team. You can go and share the gospel with them if you're so excited about this. Something, something to that degree. We'll give this person something to do. And for, it, it may even be a couple of years. Two or three years go by. They demonstrate this enthusiasm for the gospel. But then something changes. Something snaps. Something clicks. A, a switch is thrown. And their attitudes completely change. Suddenly, they begin to doubt what it is that they believe. Suddenly, they realize, you know, the stuff in this world looks a whole lot more enticing. I'm not really liking the stuff that the preacher is saying. I don't like what I hear coming from the pastor. See, I like this stuff. This, this stuff's great. I enjoy what I have going on in the world, and I don't know that I want to give that up for what it is the preacher is saying. So they begin to drift away. They may even leave the church. And for the rest of their lives, they probably do say something like, well, I'm still a Christian, but they look a lot more like the world than they look like the Christian that they were when they first received the message with joy. What this demonstrates is that they heard the word. It fell on rocky soil. Because there was no root in themselves, it springs up immediately. They look like they have some uh, 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 evidence of Christianity, of conversion in their hearts, but it doesn't last. And eventually, they wither away and die because they have no root in themselves. That's the explanation that Jesus gives. There's no root in themselves. They're not rooted in Christ. They were attempting to grow on their own, and they couldn't do it. They tried to do it you know, without the church. They, they just watched church at home on the Internet, right? I don't need the fellowship. I don't need the body of Christ. I can do this fine on my own. You don't have any root in yourself. That's a recipe for disaster. And eventually, you're going to languish, you're going to wither away, and you're going to die. You looked like a Christian for a while, but it wasn't real. Don't depend on sayings like, once saved, always saved, to save you. It is true that a person who's truly in Christ will be saved. But this is demonstrating this person was never truly in Christ. There's another example that we're given here. Jesus goes on and he says, there's another that 
is represented by the thorns. As was sown among, what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves to be unfruitful. Now, this doesn't just mean the, the stuff that's in this world that entices us, and so we go to that stuff, and it chokes out the word because we love the world more than the word. It can also mean that the cares of this world, the anxieties, the pressures of life, De- a depression that is caused by worldly things, uh, uh, the, it, just watching the news too much and falling into despair and wondering, well, maybe Jesus isn't coming back because all the world is going to hell in a handbasket. So maybe all of this stuff wasn't true anyway. So it can be stress or it can be delight in the things of this world. Either of these things can be thorns that choke out the word and it proves to be unfruitful. You don't trust in Christ, you, you trust in things in this world. You trust in politics. You trust in riches. You trust in opportunity and advancement. And if those are the things that you put your trust in, they're ultimately going to disappoint you, and they cannot save you. And that person was not truly a Christian. Demas was this way, by the way. The Apostle Paul talks about a man named Demas in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Who, uh, who was deceived by the world, and he uh, uh, left Paul, abandoned Paul, and went back to Thessalonica, and Paul says it was because he was too in love with this world. So we have examples of this throughout Scripture. The next one, it says, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another now, we're not going to be able to get to the rest of the parables here because I've spent a lot of time on the parable of the sower, as I said that I was going to. But you have the examples of these other parables that Jesus spoke here. But here's what we understand from the parable of the sower. There are some who are going to look like Christians. But over time, it's going to be demonstrated that they really weren't. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples as he sent them out in Matthew chapter 10. He said, he who endures to the end will be saved. But my friends, here's the good news. Our ability to be saved is not dependent upon ourselves. Remember again the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 11, where he said that no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. We are chosen by God. And he chooses to reveal himself to us. We don't choose God. He chose us. As Jesus said to his own disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. So it is not dependent upon you to be saved. It is also not dependent upon you to keep yourself saved. Those who are truly Christians will endure to the end. And those who go out from us, it will be shown that they were not really of us in the first place. 1 John 2.19 It says they went out from us, that we might know that they were not truly of us. For if they were of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out from us so that it would be seen that they really weren't of us. The one who is truly a Christian will remain a Christian to the end. But it is God who saves us, and it's God who keeps us to the end. Paul said to the Philippians in Philippians 1.6, I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Christ. And at the end of the book of Jude, we read this, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. But you are hearing the sound of my voice today and the gospel that has been presented to you. So I say to you, as the command of God that's been given in his word, repent, turn from your sin, believe in Jesus Christ, and so live. Those of you whose hearts have been tilled by the Holy Spirit, producing good soil, will receive that word with joy and produce a harvest. But those who do not truly know Christ, You'll either dismiss this word, it may show to be 
interesting to you for a time, but then may turn out to be a passing opinion. And then for others of you, the world will be more enticing than the kingdom of God. Do not let yourself be deceived, be led astray. Trust in Jesus Christ and live.